Good evening, everybody, and welcome to week two in CE 187. Uh, Chef Crystal and I welcome you to another fine, fine live session uh, here in 187. This class rocks. Uh, we are very, very impressed with the uh, amount of on-time submissions. Uh, so hats off to all of you. Thank you very much for the hard work. And thank you everyone for being here. I noticed that we have quite a few attendees this evening, which I love that because this class of all your classes is going to set you apart from the competition. You have to remember, regardless of whether you go into ownership, regardless of whether you're the fa uh, general manager or regional man uh, manager, regional executive chef, the information that is taught in this class is going to separate you from the remainder of the competition. So this class of all classes is very, very essential. So Chef Crystal, do you have any feedback on week one? Week one. So we're working on our content, right guys? That, that's it. I was very excited to see a lot of different things in the discussion this week. Check you guys out. Um, yeah. any, did anybody see anything that was like, that stood out to them or that they were like, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. Yeah. What did you guys think of week one? Did anybody walk away with anything from week one? Does anybody want to share? Um, Tanisha is up there shaking her head. What'd you walk away with? I'm trying to put my thoughts together. It's kind of just a lot of things I've been contemplating on uh, anyway during this course. I, mean, uh -huh. I don't know. I can't really put my thoughts and words together right now. That's okay. I heard from several students this week that shared some very interesting information uh, about what they're thinking about with their concepts. And I was really, really impressed. There's some serious creativity out there. You have to remember when you become a part of a culinary team, you're not just a cook slicing and dicing. Your opinion is very, very important and you're gonna be able to use the knowledge from this class. If anybody has any uh, questions or concerns about their concepts, reach out, send either Chef Crystal or myself a note, and uh, you know we'll definitely provide you a little feedback, so it could be really, really uh, important information. I think Rita has a question. You do, Rita, what's up, Rita? Yes, um, I'm trying to see, do we have to do anything like, um, I guess besides, um, for the assignment because I don't remember seeing anything. It was it was just the I'm behind. Nah, you're good right now. It was just the knowledge. Can you check. say that again? You're you're good right now. It was just the knowledge check this week or oh. pat this past week. This week there's a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. So you're in good shape, Rita. No worries. Willie has a question as well. Willie, what's up, buddy? Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chef. You're welcome. Willie. Are you there, Willie? I think Willie was saying he had the same question, correct? Right. Okay. Ladies and gents, I know, I know week one seemed a little slim on the work. Just relax. There's more coming down the pipe right now. So uh, last week was just a knowledge check. This week we're going to be getting into a little bit more of a different type of assignment. So there's going to be a little bit more to do this week. So uh, everybody keep doing what you're doing. I did want to talk about the knowledge checks. This past week there were some uh, people that did not get uh, 10 out of 10 on the knowledge checks. There's really no reason for that because you can take those knowledge checks as many times as you like and only the highest score is going to stick. So uh, it's very, very important uh, that you do that. Willie, I, I saw uh, your name pop up one more time. Then it disappeared. Willie? Willie, something's going on with your sound. If you want to type it into the box, I can read it out for you. So when, when he gets that in, let me know. We'll, we'll answer the question for him. Uh, no problem. Uh, ladies and gents, let's take a look at our week two class page. 
Uh, this week is a little bit different as far as the assignment is concerned. I want to make sure that everybody captures this information. At the top of the class page each week, there is a welcome video. Make sure that you take a few moments to watch that video. It's got information regarding the upcoming week. It's usually posted on Tuesday the prior week. So just click on the button and it's only about a minute long, produced by yours truly. If you notice this information right here in red letters directly underneath the week two banner, your assignment this week is a discussion forum. Your initial post is worth 60% and must be posted no later than this Saturday, October the 12th by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Initial post, and we're gonna talk about what that initial post is here in just a few moments. You are required to respond to two other students' posts no later than Tuesday, October the 15th by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time for the additional 40% of this week's grade. So it's, it's very, very important that everybody captures this information. There's the welcome video right there and then the uh, stuff in big red letters explaining this week's assignment. Every time, ladies and gents, that you see a check mark on the side of the page, by completing that activity, that will post a, uh, attendance for you. It's very, very important that you post attendance at least every three days. Otherwise, we have to hunt you down, make sure you're doing all right. The reason we want you to post attendance at least every three days those who do that succeed in the program 100%, and that is our ultimate goal. So that's why we do that. So make sure that uh, these activities with check marks, uh, make sure that you take care of those. It's very, very important. And then this week, we uh, this lesson, deciding on a location is critical because that's in the discussion forum. Target demographics, we're gonna discuss here in just a few moments. And then this week's presentation is already up on our class page. So take advantage of it if you forget any information. Thank you everyone for being here for the live session. Very, very important. And then in the discussion forum this week, we are talking about target demographics. So that is on the slate this week. Does anybody have any questions about that? Chef Crystal. I was just gonna say that Willie put in his, in what he wanted to say in uh -huh. the chat. He said, I just wanted to say that I got a little more motivation in pushing forward with my plans to open my own business after completing this uh, this week. Oh, that's totally cool. I love that. That is great. And Willie, if this is, if this is your goal, if this is your end goal, uh, really focus on this class because we're going to show you a lot of things that lead to success when it comes to creating uh, your own concept. It's very, very important. So ladies and gents, I'm not gonna go through this slide because I just went through the, the same information, but it's posted once again here on your class page in the week two slides. Your assignment discussion forum, initial post, Saturday, 60% of your grade, uh, and then a response to two other students post, no later than Tuesday for 40% of your grade. So uh, make sure that you write in that discussion forum at least three times, your initial post, and then respond to two other students no later than Tuesday, initial post by Saturday. Are there any questions about that? Everybody everybody good on that one? Because uh, I'm not sure if you had any discussion forums in 101. Rita, what's up? Yeah, I forgot how you go to the, um, I guess the form to to write messages. Is uh -huh. there a chance you uh, can, uh, um, I guess like a, a link or something? Uh, uh, are you asking like how to out. respond to people? Correct. Yeah, yeah. they added in to also post. So when, you go to the, when you go to the discussion forum, um, mm -hmm. it's gonna be a button underneath somebody else's uh post, I guess, and it's gonna say reply. So once you press reply, it's automatic. You can put whatever you want to put right there, and that's how you start it. Okay, but how do you get to it, like, to, for you to post your own first? You, that's how you post your own, right, Chef? No, you're going to go to the, I'll show you right here. Uh, you're, you're right. Now, let me show you, Rita, so you, you can understand. Uh, my, mine's a little bit different when it pops up, so it's not going to be exactly the same. But this is the week two class page right here. You're going to scroll mm -hmm. down to the assignment, 
And then you're going to click on the assignment where it says uh, target demographics. And then you will automatically go into a group. Um, but I have access to everybody's group here. Let me go back one here. See if I can bring this up. There we go. So for example, this is uh, Kadeen Haywood's uh, initial response, uh, which he's already completed. And then over here on the right-hand side, you'll see a red button that says reply. Okay. So Rita, so you can click on reply right there. So okay. you need to reply to two other students' posts. Okay. Does that All make right. sense? Thank you. You're welcome. Alejandro, what's your question? For today's, uh, not today's, this week's assignment, it's a two-part assignment? Correct. Okay. There's two different requirements. One is the initial post, and we'll get to what you need to put in your initial post here in just a few moments. And then following the initial post, you must reply to two other students' posts with your comments. All right. Does that make sense? Yes, Chef. Thank you. All right, and we're gonna get into the details of what you need to be posting here in just a few moments. Uh, if anybody else has any other questions, make sure you let us know and we're gonna help you out. So don't worry about that. Last week, ladies and gents, uh, we talked about concepts and we talked about the variety of different concepts that are out there. Uh, here's an example of some of the ones that we talked about. You know, fast casual, family style, fine dining, bistro, uh, fast food, food trucks. The first thing you need to do for this week's assignment is you need to have a fully developed concept. And what I mean by that is you should have an idea of what type of food you want to serve it to and who you want to serve it to. Does that make sense? So it is what type of food you want to serve and who you want to serve it to. And you should also have a rough idea of what type of pricing structure you want to put that into. So that's step one, and that's what we talked about last week. In this week's presentation on the class page, here's some examples of some of the stuff that we talked about last week, and it's here for your reference in case you need to refer back to it. And then moving on, uh, we are gonna share just a little bit of more information regarding this week's assignment. The assignment is a discussion. And when you make your initial post, please remember uh, that your post is a reflection of your professionalism. And so we expect you to be write and communicate in a very professional fashion to the best of your ability. And make sure you are thoughtful and make sure that you explain yourself well. Uh, when we go through and we grade this assignment, if you write, I like, period, you're not gonna do very well. So please explain your answers thoroughly. It's very, very important. We expect at least a full paragraph. Uh, and then when you respond to other students' uh, posts, make sure that you respond with positive information. And if you have any criticism, make sure that it's, it's written in a very constructive manner. We're not, here, uh, we're not here to belittle anybody or we're not here to put anybody down, but we're here to share information and network. So that is the mentality behind this week's assignment, and that's how we expect everyone to communicate. Alejandro, what's your question? Alejandro. Um, it's a very odd question, but it's somewhat tied into a little bit of last week's discussion. Uh-huh. Um, when, when, when it comes to course tasting menus, how do you know how much to charge those people that you are? Well, you're gonna learn that right now because we are about to jump into the world of demographics and I thank you for the segue, Alejandro. I couldn't, I couldn't have uh, asked for a better one there myself. Uh, your target market and your demographics are gonna determine what you can charge. So, for example, if you work with an extremely wealthy clientele that has a lot of disposable income, then you're going to be able to charge a few extra bucks for what you're serving versus if you're working with low income seniors. So uh, there is a lot of this that comes into play. So Alejandro, I'm going to answer your question in detail. Does that work? Yes, yeah, chef. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a great question, by the way. So ladies and gents, moving on to our first topic this evening, 
uh, we are going to discuss demographics. And demographics, in a nutshell, are a, it's an essential tool that you must research thoroughly now that you have your concept in place, right? You must know who you are going to serve your food to, right? Demographics are an essential understanding of who your target market is and the type of menu that you are creating. This means that you must do research to find out who are the demographics in the area that you choose to put your restaurant. So for example, if you are doing a, um, let's see, a, a family style restaurant that specializes in crayons and a children's menu and all sorts of great drinks, you're not going to put that into a senior retirement area because the demographics do not match. You will put that into a neighborhood type environment that has the demographics that you are after. Demographics are going to be defined as your target market. Your target market is who you are trying to sell that product to. Does that make sense, everybody? So for example, Alejandro asked a question about chef's tasting menus, right? Who does that appeal to? Chef's tasting menus traditionally are a little bit more expensive, so that tells me my demographics need to have disposable income. Number two, they have a tendency to be a little bit more adventurous with their food because they're oftentimes well-educated and well-traveled. So that tells me I'm either going to create my uh, concept in an area that has the demographics of people that I am looking for. Demographics for a chef's tasting menu would be um, an upscale neighborhood, an upscale area of town where the rents are gonna be higher, where you charge more food. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? So your demographic not only talks what your menu will be, but also along with the arm. No. The price that you charge them? You will be able to adjust your price according to your demographics. If you are working, if you have a concept, for example, that uh, it's, uh, let's just say you have a, uh, uh, a basic breakfast restaurant that specializes in uh, eggs over easy, toast, hash browns, and bacon. You, that would be very applicable to a lower income area, a senior retirement area where they have limited incomes, where they can afford that type of food easily. Does that make sense, Alejandro? Yes. Okay. So we're talking, the demographics are going to, to determine where you can put your restaurant. Okay? If you live in a town, for example, currently if you're in a, in a city, uh, we can use uh, Tucson, Arizona, right? Uh, where I live. Tucson, Arizona, there are some sections of the town where the residents are lower income, right? They oftentimes have fixed incomes or uh, uh, they're blue collar workers. So that tells me I'm not going to open up my restaurant with the chef's tasting menu charging $75 a person in that area because those people cannot afford that concept. Does that make sense, Alejandro? Yes. Okay, good. So the basic, uh, the bottom line to determining demographics is going to be research. And there is a lot of data out there available as to where you put your concept. You have to remember that when you are going to open a restaurant, you know, Willie was saying this is his dream and everything else. It was my dream too. This is a major investment of money a major investment of time. You really need to do your research and your homework to ensure that your concept is going to be successful. So you need to take a look around and understand your demographics. And here's a couple of sources to find that information. So you can find this information at uh, the census.gov. Uh, that's a website. They're going to provide you uh, a lot of details, and we'll get into those details here in just a second, about where you can put your restaurant. Don't be under the assumption that uh, just because you put a restaurant into a wealthy neighborhood where people have a lot of money 
uh, disposable income to spend on food that your concept is going to be successful. It doesn't work that way. The concept has to fit your demographics. Okay, it's very, very critical. Yes, Crystal, Chef Crystal. So what you're saying is if it's like, I don't know, like a lot of cities have like Chinatown or like Germantown, right? Correct. I might not necessarily put a sushi bar in Germantown because it might not fit what the people there are looking to eat, correct? That's correct. You do not want to put a Mexican restaurant in Chinatown. It's just <laughs> people aren't going to go there for it, right? But demographics traditionally are not as associated with genealogy as they are associated with age groups, educational levels, and uh, financial uh, monies and population of the household. Those are the things that really bond uh, what demographics are. So ladies and gents, uh, Convention Visitors Bureau is, uh, most towns have those. If you have a population of uh, 50,000 or more, you're going to have a Convention Visitors Bureau. If you call them up and you say, hey, uh, my name is so-and-so and I'm interested in opening up a restaurant. I'd like to learn some information about the city regarding demographics. They will supply you with a ton of information uh, to help you understand, especially who is coming to the town to visit, which is very critical because those become customers as well. And then uh, local town and uh, city government website, those will oftentimes have demographic information. Uh, whenever they do a census, they post the results onto their web pages. Great source of information. And my favorite um, one to go to of all of them is the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. The Chamber of Commerce is uh, represented or created by all the businesses within the community and how to drive more revenue into the community. If you go to them and you say, hey, I want to open up a diner. They're going to say, hey, these are some fantastic locations based on your concept because they want you to become successful and they're going to drive customers to your business. Traditionally, we want our demographics to be within a three to five mile radius of our business. Very, very important. And Definitely. then another, what's that, Chef Crystal? I, we have a hand raised. Linda has a question. Linda, what's up? Yeah, what's up? Yes, uh, I live in New Orleans. I've been here for five years now. Okay. After Mardi Gras, they start on what they call Second Line. Okay. And the Second Line is the social clubs in New Orleans that have more or less like parades like Mardi Gras. And they have different people coming out selling uh, beverages, food. And okay. I would think of having a food truck during that time would uh would be a good idea you know to for a profit you know selling food and i was thinking uh you know is that a good way to start you I know think, i think that's a fantastic way to start but let me ask you a question linda who is going to be your customer who are they oh you're muted there linda Okay. Who? Linda, can you unmute? Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. It would be the local people that live in the neighborhood that participate in the Mardi Gras besides the tourists, the tourist people, uh -huh. um, and then you still have the tourist people here, and they they tend to follow the second line, which is the part of the Mardi Gras the after the Mardi Gras. And they participate in that, and they all come contribute to all of that, the things that go on. So I think um, I could profit from having a food truck, uh -huh. you know, if the follow the, the, with the things that go on, you know what I'm saying? Um, and also with the college community, you know. Um, so based, I think based on I could do that. You're saying some really good information that I really like because it looks like you've thought this through. And I think this could be a viable concept. But, but you also mentioned the locals who work in the parade and the college students. That's a very important demographic because it can be people that like to spend money. But do you think they have much money to spend? Yeah. 
Yes, I think they do. Okay, what 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 would you imagine they could spend for a meal? Um, I, I think they would spend up to like from ten to twenty dollars a meal. It depends on what the is, you know, or what I'm offering. Okay, if I local, I give them the local cuisine. Okay, it depends on what it is. You know, I, you know, you have to think about your cuisine. What you're going to offer them. So when you give me a, when you tell me to give me a price, I have to decide what I'm going to offer them. So Linda, if you're serving burgers and fries, that's no, it's not going to be. But I don't know. That's not what I'm going at. I'm going at the Creole cuisine. I'm right. going at the local cuisine. So, right. So if you're, I'm saying, I was saying burgers and fries is a low end price. Versus your Creole cuisine is more on the higher end of uh, the spectrum. So maybe like $25, $30 a plate, depending no. on the oh, It doesn't the, have to be that high. It does not have to be that high. Okay. So based, based on what you said, Linda, um, I think you've created a good skeleton of a viable concept. If I was in your shoes right now, I would go to your Convention Visitors Bureau and find out the spending habits of the people that work in the parade and then the college students and then the tourists that are there. They will tell you how much money they will spend and how frequently they will eat out, which will help you determine how much you can charge for that local Creole cuisine. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the name of the game here is research. It's very, very important. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Chef, quick question. Hold on. Go ahead. Um, doesn't it also depend on how many of the same restaurants or the same places or places around you are offering the similar um, cuisine or options? That is a fantastic segue to our next topic. You are awesome. Between you and Alejandro, I don't need to do slides. This is great. Now, we're going to be talking about how to decide on your uh, restaurant location here in just a few moments. And that's very true, Chef Crystal. What you're bringing up is extremely important information when it comes to making that decision. V, what's up? You know, we were talking about research. And what I found, what I have started to do, is I've looked around some of the school districts. And I know it seems kind of creepy, but I checked to see if they're if it's subsidized, who's getting free lunches, because that speaks volumes. If, yes, if you're in a place where 80% of the people are getting free lunches, my food truck's not going to work in this area because there's people struggling. So I've been looking around different school counties and seeing where all the money is. Because sometimes you get a good school district where all the money's going. Sometimes maybe that's, that's the ticket. What do you think, Chef? I think you're right on the money. That is one of the angles of research on demographics. Once you establish the fact that you have found a school district uh, that has a wealthier base, then you need to make sure that your food truck concept fits within their needs. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Cool. Great, great comment. Uh, Veronica, what's up? Um, hi, I was just um, thinking, um, I can't remember who it was, was talking about New Orleans and, and their um, concept. Linda One was. thing, is, okay, Linda, as, kind of as a suggestion, would kind of be like if you did a special college, like a college menu base to, to kind of alleviate, you know, that it would, it would include, because if they don't have a whole lot of money to spend, but they want to come to the food truck, you want to be able to accommodate them. So you could do that special college ID percentage type. That's a great suggestion, Veronica. And this is the value in understanding demographics, how to attract more business. Thank you, Veronica. I appreciate that. Rita, what's up? Uh, yes, uh, like, like uh, I was thinking about a food truck also. Now, if I wanted to go to work sites, would I have to talk to the jobs? There's, you know, to the, um, I guess to the, um, what you talking, like the employment, like the employers or someone, and um, to find out if it's okay for me to do that there, or how would I do that? For well, the ab abs that I'm abs go to? 
absolutely you need you need to understand all that information so Rita, let me give you let, let me give you an example and i touched on this a few moments ago if you're going to invest your money or someone else's money into a food truck you need to be certain that that money is going to come back right because you're spending that money to make money so part of your research needs to include permits and uh, permission to visit these sites and understand. So everything needs to be uncovered. So great, great uh, point, Rita. I appreciate you bringing that up. Alejandro, what's up? When you go to any city like Atlanta or where I live in Union, which is about 25 minutes from Atlanta in Georgia. Mm-hmm. I noticed that there are multiple and many, many type of um, food to choose from, from fast food to Italian to Hispanic or Latin. Uh huh. And here in, in this city, uh huh, you know, it's not so much as uh, how do I explain uh, the type of people that are you, that you tend to see, but more as more as to a um, come in and eat type of thing. Mm -hmm. Does it affect if you're in the very center of the entire city where most of the business run, or does does demographic also affect to if you have to be somewhere in the outer rings of the city? Your debt, your demographic could draw you to the outer ring of the city. Uh, absolutely, do not focus on being. Uh, in the center of the city because that's where all the people are. Chef Crystal brought up a very valid point about location a few moments ago. And you, you need to also consider when it comes to deciding on a location, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, is that area saturated, right? Saturation is a big issue because when there's a few bucks that pop up, you've got a lot of people chasing that few bucks. And that's exactly what we're all doing in this industry is chasing that dollar bill. So. That dollar bill for you might be out in the out out in the outer ring of the city, so to speak, or in the suburbs, or might be the ideal location out there. The research you do regarding your demographics will direct you to where you should go. So Michelle, even in Atlanta, I live probably like 20 minutes away from Atlanta. Even right outside, <laughs> it's still popping for business. Like yeah. people still go right outside the city to get business because the parking's better, if you think about it. You don't have to worry about all that traffic in Atlanta. And even in Newman, if there's like a, like a, mm -hmm. if there's a place where there's a lot of office buildings, that could be, you know, might be a really good idea for you, but you just have to think if they're busy during the weekday, on the weekend, people don't really work, right? Yep. As far as office buildings or government buildings like that. So it just kind of depends on what's around you that goes along with doing that research to find out what is in your area or in the area that you're thinking about opening up your business. Exactly. Exactly. That, those are great points, Chef Crystal. You need to establish who you want to sell your food to and where they are. The demographics will tell you where they are. So it's, it's a, it sounds simple, but it requires work and research. We do not just the, drive down the street and find a location and then set up shop. It, it, it requires research. Mel, what is your question? What's up? Hey. Hey. Um, my concept is like all over the place now. Because, like, I originally wanted to do a food truck and, like, be able to provide, like, healthy meals. I'm going to have to get the chicken tomorrow. Uh -huh. um, neighborhoods that, like, neighborhoods I grew up in are, like, poverty-stricken neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And, um, can you shut my mouth? And, um, but now it's, like, like last, I think it was last week I heard you saying that, um, like, with the food trucks, like, they fail like within the first first or second year. Well, any you said the restaurants too, but I now I don't know what I want to do. I know I want to do an event hall and be able to cater and stuff like that, but I really want to do something healthy also to be able to 
to help people who don't have access to a healthy, you know, meal that doesn't cost too much. Okay, with, with your concept, number one, don't be discouraged from doing a food truck. There are, I mentioned last week that there's an 80% failure rate within the first year. There's a lot of factors as to the reason those food trucks fail within the first year. One of them is lack of research, lack of concept, lack of target market, lack of demographics. So you're learning about all that now. I think your concept is a beautiful concept trying to help other people by providing healthy meals in, in areas where they're otherwise not available. If I were you, I would consider associating myself with someone, uh, I'm sure there's governmental agencies, the FDA, the USDA, that might be interested in actually partnering with you to help provide uh, the product in the neighborhood. So uh, don't be discouraged, just make sure you do your research. Okay. Sound good? And I'll talk to you more about yeah, it. If thank you, want. you. You're welcome. All right, Tanisha, you get, did you get your thoughts together? Yes. Okay, now my concept, I've had more than one. Now my first concept was I like to do a soup, sandwich, subs, and wraps. And uh -huh. as far as the area that I would target, it would be the downtown Lafayette areas where it's a lot of corporate and, you know, the court, where stuff like that. But I would think as far as business-wise, even in a small commercial space, after 6 or 7 o'clock, once, you know, the downtown area is closed, that's why I also want to really do a food truck because we also have a lot of factories and being able to cater to the different factories and warehouses. Mm -hmm. is, the demand is there. Like uh, just last week before I had my uh, surgery, Monday I had my biggest order from Subaru for an evening lunch for second shift, 8 o'clock. I had 13 orders that wow. were pre-ordered. And it's like, the more I get my flyers and stuff to the factory, get these calls where, you know, so I'm like to be able to have a truck there on their lunch hour or, you know. But Tanisha, do you know why that is? There's nothing else open at that time. So your prime time spot, yeah. slot, everything. So, you know, that's a part of it too. Are people going to be around at eight o'clock? And then I've even had people like that work third shift. Hey, will you still deliver uh, at two o'clock? Are you taking, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna be woke, but it depends on, you know. But I know the factories for me here in Lafayette, the factories is, that's gonna be my market. And I so, figure I can go to different places with the food truck, you know, during different shifts and lunch hours and well, the first thing, the first thing that uh, you talked about uh, would be your brick and mortar location that is in downtown and you're concerned about the fact that in the evening or on the weekends, there's no business. Don't right. be misled. You can make a lot of money doing that. I had one concept, one of my restaurants uh, that I developed was in downtown Phoenix and it did very, very well and it's still open after 23 years. So. Uh, but uh, what I thought was really intelligent that you brought up, we refer to this as resource, as revenue resources, okay, or revenue streams. A lot of us think that when we open the door to a restaurant, the only money that comes in is through the front door. A customer walks in, orders food, pays, and leaves. That is not true. You brought up some other excellent re uh, revenue resources, your catering, your food truck, so now in that one facility, you have three sources of income, right? So the Monday through Friday thing or the weekend thing is no longer applicable. What my recommendation is to you is build that business solid first and then expand upon your additional sources of revenue based upon your developed concept. Does that make sense? So you develop Tanisha's righteous sandwiches, right? In downtown, wherever. Then that food truck has that Tanisha's Righteous Sandwiches written on it and people recognize it. And then Tanisha's Righteous Sandwiches Catering becomes even a bigger business. So it's but one. See, two. That's, it's, it's two different concepts. Now I got Danny Garrow's uh, Soup, Sandwich, Subs, and Wraps. And then Nini's Hot Kitchen, which caters to like the fast and casual, you know, the 
subs, wings, you know, catfish, you know, stuff like that. Pizza puff is two totally different concepts of food, you know, that so I would be with, with her saying that she has two separate concepts, should it be, would it be, um, I, I don't know what to go with. Would it be ill for her to narrow down what the needs of the community might be to well, see what it would sell best? <laughs> what, what my recommendation is, is uh, number one, unless you've got a lot of financial backing behind you, focus on the one that's making you money now and then merge it with the other concept. Because you have to remember two concepts is twice as much money in marketing, twice mm -hmm. as much uh, everything else, right? So there's a lot of overhead associated with that. It's a great thing that you've got those names established and it is feasible to merge them and still have that name uh, recognizable. So you might want to think about that. But those are some great points, Kanisha. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Let's get on a couple more questions and then we got to get going here in the class. Veronica, did you have another comment? Yes, I was actually, uh, and it's funny because I want to do a food truck as well, but it's called Not Your Ordinary Food Truck. And I was listening to the young lady speak about the um, poverty stricken area. And I personally, I have, I live in Florida and I live in an area that could be poverty stricken, but I'm close to a more high end area. So I have prices adjust on both ends. Like, I know when I'm in this city, these are their prices, but then I was trying to narrow it down so it accommodates everyone. And because we're in a poverty stricken area, I learned that even so, you still have families that tend to fit in their budget a way to go out and eat. So that's not always a, a downside. Um, there was also um, one other thing I heard, I'm trying to remember it really quickly. Uh oh, it was about the demographic. If your food is really good, the quality, the taste, people will come and they will drive a little ways to get it if, if you're not right there centrally located close to them. So that was kind of like my kind of concept is I want them to desire my food so I may not be open all the time. But you know on the third Friday I'm in this area so you will come to that area. You, you, you have a lot, you, you've got, it sounds like uh, you, you put a lot of thought into this and I, I like what you've said. I do caution you heavily though about charging different prices for different demographics based on the same product because right. actually uh, you, you will get burned for that. Uh, people do not like being overcharged because they have a few more bucks. Uh, that does catch up with you eventually. Uh, and Absolutely. Then, uh, yeah, so be real cautious about that. I would, uh, I would err on the side of caution. And then I like the way that you're thinking as well um, uh, with, uh, you know, being in the poverty stricken and not necessarily being in one certain area. Make sure that you develop your brand before you start venturing too far. So uh, your brand is your image, your product, and recognition of your brand will drive people to where you want to go. So great uh, comments, Veronica. I appreciate it. Last question. Donald, what's up? Hello. So I'm still kind of struggling with my concept i had i'd messaged you last week trying to get a little maybe a little more focused on it because my idea is more towards a family style restaurant with a, a heavy focus on fellowship around a table breaking bread with friends family strangers just everybody sharing meals together at, you know and from like you know common food you like, have a message in response right i did get one back i, I okay. And I, so I've been thinking about that ever since and trying to figure out, uh, like, I'm, I still haven't nailed down the, the type of food I want to serve. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't, I've never experienced a restaurant like that myself. So I, I'm not definitely, sure where to begin even looking. Okay. The first thing you need to do, uh, Don was working on a concept that uh, involved uh, a bakery and that it was kind of a family style communal table type thing. Uh, which I think has, uh, it, it's a, could be a very viable concept. I would heavily recommend researching the Basque region uh, because that is their style of food service. Basque region being in Northern Spain. Uh, and you might want to start taking a look at how they do things. Everything there is family style versus a la carte. Uh, so that would be my route. If you want to talk some more, send me another message. Sound good? Okay, thank you, Chef. You're welcome, Doug. All right, ladies and gents, let's move on quickly here uh, to the types of demographics. 
Uh, this slide, once again, is on your class page. But as you can tell, generations, right? That's one of the big definers of demographics. Look at the baby boomers. Baby boomers are the uh, retirees. Uh, they were born between 46 and 64. And no, I am not a baby boomer. But uh, there are 80 million people in that demographic, okay? So they have a tendency uh, to be a little bit more experienced, a little bit more well-traveled. This is the first generation that has been exposed to all foods on an annual basis um, because of pesticides and other things. We're able to grow food all year round now versus previously when we couldn't. So they're pretty good. Generation X, uh, 41 million people. And then um, the uh, millennials, uh, 71. That was a very productive generation, wasn't it? Aren't you a millennial chef? Uh, I actually, uh, Generation X would. Um, I thought we were both millennials. No, no well, I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I've matured since then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these are just some of the things that we take a look for. Uh, because when you go and you do your research on your uh, target market, your demographics, they're going to share with you the age group of the residents, household income level, uh, educational level, home ownership, uh, and that type of information. So that's what you're going to use to compile your demographics. It is a big subject and you must do research. Step one, narrow in your concept. Understand what type of food you want to serve. Number three, who do you want to serve it to, right? And then after you figure that out, you're going to figure out where are your demographics? Where are my customers? You might be in an area, right, that yeah, you make this awesome product and you have, uh, you know, 15, 20 people that love to eat that awesome product. But is that really enough demographic to support your business? So you need to figure all these things out. What will motivate your customers, ladies and gents, right? Price. Uh, individuality, experience, service rating. How will you differentiate yourself? How will you, uh, what will you be in your, what, what's your niche? What's gonna attract people? Uh, and you know, that can really be defined by who your target market is and what your demographics are. So it's very, very important uh, demographics. Chef Crystal. She gave us a wonderful segue a few moments ago into location, ladies and gents. Location is critical. Okay, so we figured out who uh, our customer is. We know what our concept is. We know what kind of food we are. And we just discovered yesterday who our demographics are. So now that will help us determine where to put our restaurant. There's a couple of things that we want to look at here. We'll share a slide real quick. You need to determine who you're gonna sell this food. This is your target market, right? Then you understand your demographics. You have to research those demographics to understand what type of food and beverages those demographics like, right? That way you can have a clear vision of what you are thinking about. For example, if your demographic is baby boomers, right? You're not gonna open up a place that blares loud music, right? And so does uh, two for one or ladies nights, right? Those concepts don't fly with senior citizens. And so the demographics of that neighborhood are going uh, to determine all that. Ladies and gents, once you've developed your price instruction, you'll need to estimate the amount of covers per day, okay? A cover is referred to as a customer. How many people do you plan on serving per day? Okay. If you know that you are going to charge $10 per meal, Linda estimated between 10 and 20 on, on, on her uh, menu items. Uh, so let's say if you're gonna charge $10 per meal and you're planning on doing 100 people per day or 100 covers, right? That's gonna be $1,000 per day in revenue. 30% of that, is rent, okay? So it's $300 per day in rent. So that gives you a little bit of money to play with and that can kind of help you determine how much you can pay in rent. Or I'm sorry, I, I said 30%, it's actually 10% is, is the actual number. So if, if you do $1,000 per day in revenue, 10% of that would be $100 per day 
that you can serve that you can pay in rent. So if you do hundred thousand dollars a month, you can pay ten thousand dollars a month in rent. That will also help you determine where you can put uh, your business. Now that you've determined how much you can pay in rent, you can even zero in a little bit further, right? So these are a couple of questions that you need to ask yourself before you determine where you want to put your restaurant. Does my target market live or congregate in that area? Are those, Linda talked about college students and uh, tourists and uh, people that work in the parade. Are they in the area? Is that where they live? Is that where they visit? And if it is, then yes, put your restaurant there, right? Is there enough foot and vehicle traffic in the area? A big portion of your location is determined by foot traffic and vehicular traffic. How many people drive by that location on a daily basis, right? How many people walk by that location? If it is in an alley with no visibility, you're not gonna get any value for your money. Chef Crystal alluded to this earlier in the class. What about the other businesses in the area? Chamber of Commerce will gladly share all of that information. Is the area saturated, right? Are there too many restaurants in that area? Can you make your money back? It's a big, big question. Another big question you wanna ask yourself, are there event, event venues in that area that might cause traffic jams? We talked about doing a place downtown. That was Tanisha. She brought up uh, doing a sandwich shop downtown. There's a lot of stadiums and other things that are in the downtown area. Are they going to block your flow of traffic that prevents customers from being able to get to your restaurant? At five o'clock is the road a gridlock, right? You need to research all of this information to understand if you plan on focusing on dinner and at five o'clock your intersection is deadlocked because of rush hour traffic, guess what? People aren't gonna go to your restaurant because they can't get to it. Demographics of the area, critical, absolutely critical. And we've just discussed demographics. Does anybody have any questions? Anyone? Chef Crystal, any comments? Um, I don't have any comments, but Alejandro just had his hand up. And I wasn't oh, he ran away and hit again. Alejandro. Uh, can you post that page that you just showed us on the, on the class uh, page? It's on the, the last class. Slide? It's on the class page. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it's under week two slides. Yep. Okay. Tanisha, what's up? Did you have a question or a Chef Crystal? Yes, I just wanted to uh, probably get you guys' opinion now for with my meals, what I've been doing, everything, even though it's uh, different menu items, I pretty much charge the same price for everything, like $12 and then a dollar delivery. But it's like the portion size, it don't matter what they're getting, they're, it's worth every bit of it. Everything comes with, you know, the sides and the drinks. And so, I mean, what about that? Like, I thought about, like, okay, if I was to add, like, a dessert or something like that and having that price separate, but just right now, everything's pretty much a flat rate. You know, you pay the extra dollar for delivery or depend on how far in town they are, you know. Have you taken 167 yet? Uh, I believe, I'm not sure. I don't think so, but yeah. Portion cost, yeah. portion cost, purchase and cost. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's where I've, I've been kind of, since I had that class, that's kind of what I've been going off of, keeping track of what I'm spending and, you know. This, is your, this is your business in a nutshell. You, yeah. food, food is money, right? You're going to put money into a bag you're gonna take it to somebody and they're gonna give you money in return. And it has to be more money than what's in the bag. It's that simple. And uh, 
so you're going to really need to start costing those items out to make sure that you don't have any of what we call loss leaders, right? Uh, yeah. Is, so far, so far, um, from my calculations and what I've been keeping track of, what I'm spending and what I'm making is I'm actually doubling my money making, you know, I'm not spending as much and just selling, you know, the meals at that flat rate for everything. I'm making my money. It's yeah. That's awesome. I, I love yeah. hear, hearing that. But once you go into brick and mortar uh, and you start having additional overhead expenses, all that's going to change. So, you know, right. Cause I don't have that as of now. Right. Yeah. Right. I understand. Those things get a little expensive. Yeah. So that would cause for a change mm -hmm. once you got, you know, all the other expenses going on and okay, I get it. Absolutely. All right, ladies and gents, let's take a look at this week's assignment. Okay. I think we mentioned this a couple times already, but just in case you happen to miss it, this slide presentation will be on the class page, or as a matter of fact, it already is because we're so fast. Chef Crystal and I move at lightning speed. It's already on the class page. It's up, ladies and gents. So if there's anything that we discussed tonight that you did not happen to capture fully, you can simply click on this link that says week two slides, and it's all right there for you. As well, Chef Crystal and I are here at your service, and we are here to help and support you, so don't be afraid to reach out. We have mentioned on several different occasions this evening, initial post due on Saturday. That's 60% of your grade. Make sure that you write in a professional fashion. Make sure that you complete your thoughts when you write. Do not write, I like it. Do not write, it's good, right? Explain yourself what you're trying to get the whole thought out. Respond to two other students' post by Tuesday. That's the remaining 40% of your grade. Very, very important. Initial post by Saturday, two responses, no later than Tuesday. You are going to pick one menu from this list and answer the following questions. So, El Gato Grande, La Patisserie Paris, La Choux, or wheel, uh, Shell on Wheels. Shell on Wheels. Where did they come up with that? <laughs> That one's cute. I like it. <laughs> Shell on wheels. I, I, I started thinking like this big snail driving around. Yeah. But never mind. Uh, you're going to pick one of those uh, menus. You'll, you'll click on the link right here. You just click on it and boom, it'll open it up and it'll give you the information you need to answer your questions. Which menu did you choose? Make sure it's in there so I can see it. Make sure you write the name of the menu. If you choose El Gato Grande, make sure you write El Gato Grande. It's very, very important. What age group should this restaurant target? That was on the previous slide about the demographics, about the baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, all right there. What income level should this restaurant target? Is it gonna be wealthy people, middle income people, low income people? Who is it gonna target? Who is it after? And then what aspects of the menu led you to pick these target demographics. So you're going to say, hey, they're very wealthy people. They're going to have high incomes. And then you have to explain why. And then you're going to list one age or income demographic you don't think each restaurant should pursue and why. Right? Are there any questions about that? Anyone? Did I miss anything, Chef Crystal? No, Chef. But I did want to say, I did want to say, even if you are not planning on opening your own concept, this is really important to know because personally, I have been a general manager in a restaurant that I'm coming in and the restaurant is brand new. And they're like, oh, we don't know what we want to put on the menu. But I have this training so I can help them. And now you're getting paid more to help them curate their menu. Yeah. So just even if you're not like, oh, I don't really want to open a restaurant, this is knowledge to soak up and just receive because you never know what, where your career is going to take you and what you're going to be able to be a part of one day. And this could be like the light bulb in the back of your head. Like, oh, I did this before. I know what this is. Rita does have a question. Rita, what's up? Uh, when you pick, let's say, uh, what's that, uh, petition for parents, let's say uh, you pick that, 
would you click? <clears throat> excuse me. Will you click on like the the uh, the title and it'll pull up some information, or we have to just uh, put oh. in our own words? Just click on the title. Oh, okay. Yeah, and okay. then you just answer the questions based on what you see. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Thank yeah. you. You're Thanks, welcome. Jeff. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for an absolutely fantastic live session. Thank you, Chef Crystal, for being my partner in this class. Uh, I think it's uh, all good. I'm really excited to dig in to this discussion forum this week. I have a feeling we are going to get a lot of good information. Do not forget to keep your attendance posted. We talked about the check marks on the class page. Make sure you're doing one of those activities at least every three days uh, to keep yourself current. This ensures your success, and that is Chef Crystal and I's goal. We want to make sure that happens. Ladies and gents, any questions, make sure you reach out. You let Chef Crystal or myself know we are here to help you. So have a great evening, everybody. Take care.